Top three arguments against the rapture exposed. Hey Frank, just to let you know, just talk loud. Okay. Clear. Mm -hmm. Slow. Yeah. To them in the camera. Okay. Smile. Okay. Don't fart. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. It appears that the rapture is to many believers the figment of somebody's imagination. The rapture is seen as a relatively new doctrine without any historical basis or biblical foundation, with an invented word to fit its teaching. The confusion surrounding the teaching of the rapture is really overwhelming. Everyone has their own reasoning, if it is or isn't, and biblical passages are basically ready to go and fly on either side. As I study the rapture doctrine and delve into the debates surrounding it, I've examined both sides to gain a clear understanding to make an informed judgment. Three main arguments are used against the anti-rapturists to support their views, and these arguments lead many believers into widespread confusion about this biblical teaching. As the two sides debate, those in the middle are just confused. While the rapture is a biblical doctrine, it seems to be a hidden truth to many believers because no one seems to know anything about it. The truth about the rapture is hidden from the anti-rapturist crowd. That's where it's hidden from and shielded by their three main arguments that they basically stand behind. The truth of the rapture remains obscure and unintelligible to them, thus perpetuating their confusion to the rest of the world. They're confused, everybody else has to be confused. So to establish the truth of the rapture, several anti-rapturist arguments must be effectively countered and properly refuted. And this is what I'm gonna start doing tonight. So by doing so, both sides of the debate are gonna be clarified, providing a clear understanding of each perspective, allowing you to make an informed judgment for yourself. Now, here's a broad overview of what the debate entails. What is the rapture debate about? First question, is there one? Is there a rapture? Answers, no, there's no rapture. Yes, there is a rapture. Those are the only two sides you can take. I haven't seen a third one. Those answering that there is a rapture, then they ask another question, which is, is it pre-trib, mid-trib, or is it post-trib? These are the main points of contentions to the rapture doctrine. I'd like to address the perspective of those who assert that there is no rapture. I'm gonna be telling you what they say, what their arguments are, and then I'm gonna be putting my argument. So I'm bringing this to a court case. You are the judge. You're gonna hear a couple of what these people say, and you're gonna hear what I'm gonna be saying tonight. You put them side by side, and then you make your own judgments from there. So people ask, is there a rapture? So the anti-rapturists, the guys that don't believe in it, say, no, there is no rapture. Now, anti-rapturists categorically deny deny the rapture doctrine completely with the following three arguments. First argument, people don't believe the rapture because the word rapture is not found in the Bible. Okay, second argument, people don't believe the rapture because the doctrine, the teaching of the rapture is nowhere to be found from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, for these first two statements, notions, concepts, or beliefs to be true, the scriptures have to be silent about it. But the Bible isn't. In fact, it has much to say in its defense. Note, when they say the word rapture is not found in the Bible, they're indirectly implying that the teaching of it also is not in the Bible. The third argument now, people don't believe in the rapture because it's a relatively new doctrine. There's no teaching of any rapture or even the word rapture before the 1830s. Okay, good arguments. For this last statement, notion, concept, or belief to be true, church history now has to be silent. But it's not. In fact, it has much to say about it. These are the main arguments they often assert without providing any proofs to support their position. I'd like to address argument number one tonight in this particular Bible study. Here's an example, the United Church of God. I'm quoting from them. Now you may believe that Bible prophecy teaches the rapture, but fact or fiction? The word rapture can't even be found in the Bible. That's a fact. Did you know that the word rapture isn't even in the Bible? You see, just because millions of books have been sold about it, doesn't make it true, end quote. What I just quoted, thousands upon thousands revolve around this particular idea. Now the opponents of the rapture use these invalid arguments to further and settle their particular beliefs. 
groups. These opponents may include theologians, certified scholars, PhDs, doctors of theology, pastors, ministers, teachers, and whatever else titles that they have. I've got this list because by reading multiple websites, blogs, and whatever it is, they always put up their titles. I am so-and-so. By the end of this one, I'm going to give you one person. I think they got three or four titles and they're trying to show how these are all my titles and you should believe me because. Let me go through this and then we're going to get to this uh, particular comment. And I'd like to add to this list those who hear and parrot what they've heard without checking the information for themselves. So one person speaks to a crowd of a hundred, the hundred goes out, they speak to another hundred and all of a sudden now it starts multiplying like a very bad virus. Their first argument hinges on the absence of the word rapture in the Bible. I will address and put this argument to rest once and for all. At first glance, it seems like a solid argument for the anti-rapturists. However, as you delve deeper into this line of reasoning, it quickly starts falling apart. When considering other quote-unquote non-existent words that describe biblical thoughts, principles, doctrines, or even teachings. As you'll soon come to realize, this line of reasoning is insufficient to support the intended purpose that there is no rapture, which is to disprove any existence of any rapture in the Bible. This type of reasoning does not weaken the rapture side of the argument, rather it strengthens it when compared to other quote-unquote non-existent words. When they say the word rapture isn't mentioned in the Bible, they're indirectly implying that the teaching of it also is not found in the Bible. This assertion is the furthest thing from the truth. This claim is a deception to lure people away from the genuine understanding God gives about the rapture in the Bible. If a word describing a biblical subject isn't found in the scriptures, then according to the anti-rapturist standard reasoning, that teaching also is not found in the scriptures. This assumption leads many to believe that they have a solid foundational argument against the rapture teaching. But is this reasoning sound? Let's take a closer look. If we apply the standard reasoning to other words that aren't in the Bible, yet the topic or the subject is let's see how these anti-rapturists are going to fare. So here's a few examples. Everyone on both sides of the debate, they're going to agree that some of God's attributes are His omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence. Give you a very quick definition. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Omniscience means all-knowing. And omnipresent means present everywhere. These are words that have been used for the longest time, hundreds if not thousands of years, to describe God. Yet two of these words are not in the Bible. Omnipotent, meaning all-powerful, is found in Revelation 19.6. I want you to turn there. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So omnipotent, we use it at the pulpit, we use it when we're talking to people. It's found in the Bible, so that's going to be legit according to the anti-rapturists. Very good. Let's go to omniscience now. Omniscience means all-knowing. This word is nowhere to be found in the Bible. But I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 46. We'll start reading in verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. You have to be all-knowing to do that. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I want you to turn to 1 John 3.20 now. And it says, for if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Seems to be pretty understandable. I just took two of many verses. I've got many, many more verses to prove this. To establish God's omniscience or that He is all-knowing. The teaching or doctrine of God's omniscient is established. I just gave you two verses. I must have about, I don't know, five, six, ten more verses showing in different places where God is telling everybody, I am all-knowing. I just took two verses. I think it should be enough to establish this particular fact. Now, according to anti- rapturous logic, if the word is not there, the teaching of it also isn't there. But I just proved them wrong with this one example. I just blew their argument out of the water, but I'm not finished. I think you know me by now. So the question is, does the word omniscient have to be in the Bible for the doctrine of it to be in the Bible? Absolutely not. With these few sample verses that I just gave you, we see that the doctrine is laid out and it's established. You can't say, no, it's not there without the word necessarily being there. So their argument basically becomes null and void. Conclusion, that the word is there or not does not diminish the teaching of it. Keep this in mind as we're going to be going through the other examples. So let's 
Let's go to the next example. Omnipresent, meaning present everywhere. And this word, omnipresent or omnipresence, is not found anywhere in the Bible. Now, the omnipresence of the Father. Again, I've condensed this. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? He's everywhere at the same time. How about the omnipresence of the Father and Jesus? I want you to turn to John chapter 14 and verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, that is the Father and the Word, Jesus, will come to him, to the believer, and make our abode with him. To abide in everybody involves omnipresence, meaning to be present everywhere. A million believers around the world, he's in a million places around around the world. How about the omnipresence of Jesus? In John 3.13 it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he, speaking of himself, that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So here Jesus is in heaven and simultaneously also on earth. And by the way, depending on what version of the Bible you have, this last clause, these last four words have been taken out of most Bible versions today, which is in heaven. This is a verse that actually proves the deity of Jesus Christ. So let's cover the omnipresence of the Holy Ghost now. In John 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you, talking about the believer, forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he, the Spirit of truth, dwelleth with you, underline that, the believer, and shall be in you, the believer. For the Spirit, to abide and dwell with every believer, he's omnipresent, making himself as God. And he is God because he's got an attribute that Almighty God, the Godhead, actually has. Now, one sign of God's omnipresence is found in him residing in all believers around the world at the same time. Satan can only possess one person person at a time. So does the word omnipresent have to be in the Bible for the doctrine of it to be present? For the doctrine of it to actually be in the Bible? Absolutely not. With these few sample verses that I just gave you, we see that the doctrine is laid out and established without the word omnipresent necessarily being there. So their argument again to these anti-raptures is null and void. Now I'm saying them because the word rapture is not in the Bible, so everything becomes null and void. No, no, your head is null and void. By the way, these last set of verses I just gave you also prove that the three members of the Godhead are all God, meaning they're all omnipresent. Now the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, yet the doctrine is. Does the word have to be in the Bible for the corresponding teaching of it to actually be legit? I'm going to continue this in another Bible study. So tell me, Mr. Anti-Rapturist, if the word is not in the Bible, that doctrine becomes non-existent, right? I want you to try this one on for size. The word atheist is not found anywhere in the Bible. Therefore, according to your reasoning, there are no atheists. Yet the Bible contradicts you. There are atheists in the Bible, and by the way, God calls them fools. I want you to turn to Psalm 14.1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Does the word have to be there? Here's another one for you. We speak of God's providence, but those words aren't found in the Bible. So according to your reasoning, there is no divine providence. Divine providence is a simple term which refers to the idea that God is actively involved in the world, guiding, caring for, and overseeing all aspects of his creation. It suggests that God has a plan and purpose for everything that happens. And even though we may not understand it, his wisdom and care are at work in our lives and the world around us. Divine providence providence emphasizes the belief that God's hand is involved in the unfolding events of history and in the individual lives of people. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Again, this is talking to everybody. It's a divine attribute that only God can have guiding everybody at the same time. Let's look at another verse showing God's divine providence. It's found in Psalm 23 1. 
one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is God divinely providing for you whatever it is that you need in your life. Let's look at another example. Psalm 145, verse 15 and 16. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand, and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. Now again, divine providence, those words are not found in the scriptures. Yet the teaching of it, the doctrine of it, is found in the scriptures. Let me give you another verse. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I just gave you four verses showing you God's divine providence. The words are not to be found in scripture. Does that negate that actual doctrine or teaching in the scriptures? Absolutely not. So when we come to the word rapture, it's not found in the Bible. What are you trying to show me? You're going to show me your IQ, which is basically your shoe size. I've just given you five examples of, quote, words that are not found in the Bible. And yet the uh, teachings are found in the scriptures. I have about another 17, 18 examples of words that describe biblical topics and subjects that are not found in the Bible. According to your viewpoint, these doctrines or teachings are not in the Bible. Is that how you read and interpret scripture? The word has to be there or else? You're skating on the wrong pond. The ice is getting very, very thin for you. And by the way, how are you doing up to now? Not doing too well, huh? Okay, because you're going to have to go through these five I gave you. And if you're going to counter all of them, like I said, I got another 17, 18 of them. And if you're really me off, I'm going to go out there and find another 160 of them if I have to do that. You don't have to see a specific word in the Bible in order for its teaching or doctrines it describes to be true. Even though the word rapture or others aren't found in the Bible, it doesn't negate its doctrine if, and big if, its teaching is supported in Scripture. Thinking this way is going to blind your eyes and your mind to all that God wants you to know by Him guiding you into all truth. If your mind is closed, all the words not there, I'm not even going to look for it. You're doing yourself a great disservice. Another fast one that we're not going to go there, God is immutable. We've heard the word immutable. I've heard it in the past 40 years, I don't know how many times. You'll find this in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, meaning that He never changes. The word is not there, but God is immutable. So according to your logic, you're basically erasing God and all of His attributes. Wow, with one word you're speaking, you're erasing half, three quarters of the Bible. These few examples I've given you should be enough for you to start licking your wounds. So does the word rapture have to be in the Bible for its doctrine to be true? Tell me, are you listening to these anti-rapturists? This is from the crossingroadchurch.com. Quote, it is easy to take for granted as biblical truth even though it's nowhere in the Bible. End quote. Here's another false statement. Barbara Rossing, New Testament scholar, Lutheran ELCA, no idea what that is, fancy letters for whatever. She's supposed to be a pastor and author of The Rapture Exposed. Apparently she blew the rapture out of the water. So watch what she says, quote, now she's supposed to be a New Testament scholar, a pastor, and an author. And this is what she says. The rapture is not a biblical word. That's the most important thing to say first of all. It's not in the Bible the so-called rapture, end quote. This week I wanted to cover the word is not in the Bible. Next week I'm going to cover the actual doctrine being in the actual Bible. So I've just shown you the deception when somebody says the word, whatever it is, is not found in the Bible. In this case, if they say that the word rapture is not found in the Bible, they're basically saying that the doctrine of it is not found in the Bible. I just put this particular argument to rest. Next week I'm going to take argument number two. The words eternal life are found in the Bible. Have you accepted God's gift yet? Your next breath is not guaranteed to you. So I want you to watch this video. This might be the most important three minutes that you might spend in all of your life. I want you to watch this video. Get saved. The gift is free. You're never going to get an invoice in the mail. Trust me on that one.